Our first session to kick us off, we're going to hear from some Endeavor entrepreneurs about their experiences scaling globally from Miami. So uh, please welcome up to the stage. As I call your name, come on up and join the panel up here on one of these chairs. Please welcome Carlos Diaz, the co-founder and executive vice president of Intic. All right. Carlos. Andres Rodriguez, the chief technology officer of Nimbler. Sebastian Serrano, the founder of Riplo. And Woo. Annabelle Perez, the president and chief executive officer of Novo Payment. All right, guys, and your mics are right here, and we're really excited to have you today. Hello? Hello? Is, hello? Hello? Well, thank you for that introduction, and thank you, everyone, for being here this morning. Um, Gentlemen, fellow Endeavor Entrepreneur, thank you morning. as well you. for being morning. here this morning. Thank you. For those who are not familiar with Endeavor, Endeavor it's a global organization that select, mentor, and um, help an entrepreneurs from around the world to uh, accelerate their business and go globally. And here with us are also representatives from Endeavor Miami and Uruguay and Ecuador. So thank you as well for being here. For the next 30 minutes, we're going to talk and discuss with these amazing tech entrepreneurs about how they scale their business. So let's get started. Um, Carlos, what factors and motivations um, um, help you to um, decide to scale your business globally? So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So, Entic, we are a uh, cloud based analytics platform. For the real estate market, uh, we help commercial buildings save energy uh, through cloud-based algorithms. Uh, our customers are the Miami Marlins, Jackson Memorial Health, Blackstone, Hilton Worldwide. So, uh, you know, as we started to expand outside of our backyard, city of Miami, Fort Lauderdale, and start going nationally, um, the clear next step was to start move to the international markets. Um, you know, really driven by our investors and, uh, and our global partners and saying, hey, you know, this is great in South Florida, this is great in the U.S., but, you know, can we bring this to countries like, you know, Panama, uh, Latin, places in Latin America, and, and ultimately Europe and Asia. So it's really, once you start getting into that expansion mode, um, you start thinking about international scaling, and, uh, and there's a lot of factors you need to think about when you're preparing for that. Right. Andres, you come from a very different... Uh, sector. What are your thoughts with regards to going global? So I think that um, the, the batch of companies that have gone global lately, um, it, it's, it's companies like Uber were founded less than 10 years ago and they went globally almost uh, instantly. So I think that a lot of the companies that we're founding in the digital sector are a very natural fit to going global very fast. Um, and I think that we're doing it uh, by understanding how the healthcare market functions in other countries, um, which is not always easy. For example, in China, people don't make appointments to go to the doctor, uh, and we didn't know that. So that's pretty much like a country that will have to think about how to uh, get into in a very different way. Um, but I think that that um, the way that we attack going global right now is by understanding which countries function in a similar way to the US and uh, trying to bring our services there. Okay, uh, Sebastian. Uh, for us, was from day one, we saw ourselves as a global company. So we are a um, mobile wallet that allows access to cryptocurrencies and credit and be able to pay online. And we are based on using blockchain technology and we think like it will help lower the cost to access to financial services and bring more financial inclusion. And in our region, that is a, a, a big need. So we always saw ourselves as a global company. And from the day one was in our minds to, to go global. And I think like in, the, in this time, like the, the only way that you can think a, a technology company is for, a, for, for it to be global. I'm going to stay with you. Um, you are in a very interesting space, uh, cryptocurrency, crypto assets, and the associate technology, blockchain. How do you balance scaling in, with regards to going slowly or uh, fast? Yeah. What are your considerations? Hopefully, one of the things in, in this market is there is 
a lot of access to capital. Like we, uh, it, being a Latin American company, you will always have like trouble fundraising, but in this sector, anyone can get funds uh, very easily. And we have raised more than $40 million. So capital has not been uh, an issue for us. And so the, the most challenging things are how you grow your, your talent. Access to talent is very difficult. Um, there is no, uh, for example, the, the kit did this technology has no experts. Uh, it's so new that you had to, we had to teach our own developers on, on how to code in these new languages and build practices that are, at no, uh, are new. So that's, that's a challenge in itself. And the other thing that is also challenging is uh, if you grow a company very fast, you enter into a risk that you, the, it's difficult to maintain the values and the core mission of, of where you're going. So you have to balance uh, on growing at a, phase, at a pace that you can con maintain your identity and, and, keep, uh, and keep the organization working properly. So you had, especially for us, it's, finding that balance. Okay, Carlos, uh, you have uh, also a lot of history with regards to scaling fast and, 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 and taking uh, different directions. Why don't you share your experience? So I think, um, you know, as an as a entrepreneur, the idea of, of, of growing a, a typical brick and mortar technology company, one that is not purely based on software in the cloud, uh, there is infrastructure, there is installation, Global scaling is something we had to think for a long time about. Um, you know, when we started the company back in 2011, I think 2012 or 2013, we had an opportunity with someone pretty famous to take Entic to Brazil, and uh, and and myself and the co-founder were excited. We were uh, uh, enamored. We were wow. You know, someone's thinking about Entic to go to Brazil. We jumped on a plane, flew down, saw the buildings, thought everything was great came back and said, you know, how are we going to do this? For every installation, we're going to have to send people on a seven or eight hour flight. And, uh, and we eventually backed off, realizing that the, the expansion globally will take its course. Um, you know, for entrepreneurs, my, my recommendation is to, to be careful, think about it, because there's a lot of nuances. Your, you know, your, corp your identity of your company, all the different uh, uh, cultures, changes that, that, that occur in, in, in other markets may affect negatively your company. So you, you have to really think about it um, you know, with a long-term mindset. Cool. Uh, well, I'm going to move to another uh, topic. Uh, so Andres, could you share uh, the, uh, with us the um, technical and regulatory challenges uh, taking global your, um, your company? Yeah, so what we do, we need to connect to the EHR software that, practi that, manage, um, that practices have to handle order back office. So for us, it's difficult because many different countries have different software that manage practices. Here in the US, it's pretty much owned by uh, 10 big software companies. Epic is the largest. Uh, but as you move to other countries, uh, in Italy, for example, a lot of people manage their practice via Google Calendar which was a good thing for us because we were connected with, uh, with Google. Um, so I think that in our case, it has been difficult on both accounts, technically, uh, understanding the types of software that drive healthcare practices in other countries. Uh, and on the regulatory side, fortunately, I think the, the, the most um, strict regulatory environment is the US. Here you have to be HIPAA compliant, and they make you jump through a lot of hoops. Um, um, the right hoops, I would add. Uh, but in, in other countries, it's not as strict as in the US. Maybe Europe has a lot of regulatory uh, uh, things that you need to go through. Uh, Canada is very similar to the US. Uh, Mexico, which is one of the countries that we're in, uh, is not as strict. It's more like um, um, yeah, a more lax environment. So I think that, that you do need to put a lot of thought both uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, the types of countries that you're going to go into and understand especially the, the regulatory environment that you're going to be moving into. And you have discovered that before or during the process? <laughs> both, I guess. Uh, you always do that. Yeah, you never, yeah, yeah. Sometimes you find 
good surprises, and sometimes you find uh, bad surprises. Like the, <laughs> the, the Google thing, for example, in, in Italy was a, a, a good surprise. Yeah. Um, and, and, and HIPAA here in the US, you always find uh, more challenges around the corner. The, the, the types of things that you need to do to be HIPAA compliant seems to be uh, never ending. Yeah. Well, Sebastian, um, no. probably you face a similar challenge that we face at Noble Payment, uh, in which you need to be very friendly with banks to, to be in some way um, success with your business strategy. Could you elaborate a little bit about the technical and regulatory challenge of your business? Well, for us, the regulatory challenges are, are huge, um, especially because there is still no regulation and uh, the regulation is cooking right now. So um, for us has been always engaged with the regulator and try to explain the technology, make it uh, in a way that they can understand the technology, but because the worst thing that you want is that the regulator regulates without that understanding and that could be very dangerous. Um, it had, in, we have different levels of success uh, in different countries, but for example, in Argentina, which is our main country, we have a very open regulator that the central bank is posting about blockchain and Bitcoin in their blog. Um, we have a group of innovation with the regulators looking at how we can apply the blockchain technology to improve the financial, the financial sector. Um, and our strategy has been always been very, um, very open and have a good dialogue. And that has been very good into keeping a, a good environment for, for growing. And with banks, banks uh, have a tendency to uh, try to their risk from their portfolio. Every company that presents uh, um, a potential for a fine or have trouble with, with the regulator. So with them, we also have very tight compliance uh, program that we discuss with our banks and that we go into an agreement on flows of information and and keeping it uh, very tight i think like for a company for like us uh, building very good partnerships with banks is, is key and devor has been helpful with that and uh, has given us a, a good introductions with key people in, in some banks that were very helpful and the and be very open into the management of, of banks is is crucial. Oh. Uh, what about you, Carlos? Ah. So for us, um, regular you know regulatory rules is not you know in the cloud-based industry and in, in real estate, it's very loose. Um, but this is you know one of the nuances and the challenges that you know we don't know about in in, in Latin America and Europe and, and 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 globally. So this is why we joined the Endeavor Group. Um, we feel that Endeavor um, can, can enable our company to understand really what regulations are out there, what rules we need to abide by, um, and what infrastructure we're going to, you know, challenges we're going to come up against. So I think this is really where Endeavor uh, plays a key role in helping entrepreneurs uh, that are getting ready to scale uh, that, that may have challenges that they don't even know what to expect. Yeah. Well, I'm going to move uh, to another topic. And, and, and with you, Andres, um, the, the factor of talent. I mean, I, you are in a very hot space these days, artificial intelligence. Uh, so I, I assume that there's a lot of competition uh, uh, recurring uh, talent. What are your challenges identifying um, qualified um, um, employees around the globe? Yeah, that's that's um, uh, this is my third startup, and and uh, the first startup I founded it in Silicon Valley, um, and it was very hard to acquire talent. Whenever I found a, a good person, um, Google or Facebook or whoever would come right after and uh, pay them double what I was paying them, and and I couldn't hold on to good talent. Um, the, the, this time around, we founded the company with half uh, a, a foot in Mexico and the other one in Santa Monica in California. Uh, and that has helped us because in Mexico, we can actually recruit top talent. Um, we pay less than what we pay in the US. Uh, and we have really a dream team of people in Mexico City on the engineering side. So that has been like a, a godsend for us. 
Um, we are a distributed company. We have people in, in, in Palo Alto, in uh, Santa Monica, in uh, Mexico. Uh, and we operate like a distributed company, so pretty much everything happens on Slack. Um, and I think that that has been good for us, and, and we're in the process of hiring someone in Spain. Um, so I think that nowadays, if you are a digital company, it's a very good thing because you can pretty much hire anyone anywhere. Um, and it also helps you scale because you understand the world much better through your own company than you would if you were a company of 10 people operating out of Mexico City and trying to take over the world. So I think that that's a good thing. Um, the fact that you can find very good talent anywhere uh, and, and, and not have to compete with, with Google or Facebook to try to retain employees. Yeah, but any, any invitation to attract uh, talent uh, with regards to training and, and providing them a great compensation package? <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> I'm not I mean, sure. I, 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 I see every day Google launching uh, 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 free courses for engineers to learn how to code. And, and it, do, do that compete uh, to, to put you in a position that uh, demand more from you? Uh, I mean, yeah, 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 always. Uh, I think that the, the, um, the key to attracting good talent is always um, for a startup, it's obviously there is an economic incentive. If the startup does well, the employees do well. But also, you get to see much more of the problem when you are a small startup than you would if you were at a, um, a, at a very large company. Um, and what I mean by that is that you understand the problem. Engineers at a company hold the entire problem in their head. Engineers at Google hold a very a tiny, tiny, tiny slice of the problem in their head. Uh, and that's good for us, and at the same time, the fact that we are an AI company applying AI technologies at a worldwide scale, it's very attractive for engineers, for example, in Mexico City. Uh, a lot of the companies that we compete with in Mexico City are to go and work for, I don't know, Liverpool or one of the big chains where the problems are not going to be as interesting as the types of problems that we are uh, uh, facing. So I think that works in our favor. We, we, good engineers tend to uh, flock towards interesting problems, in my, in my experience. And if you present them with interesting problems and a, a, a good culture in which they can work, uh, they're going to want to work for you. Yeah. Carlos, uh, what, antic, uh, what problem do, do so we So we've gone, you know, in the talent space, we're, we're in Broward County. So we compete with two big, uh, two big software companies, Ultimate Software and, and Magic Leap. Both are, are very successful, well-funded, and well-known. Um, I think a couple of things really help drive talent. Number one is culture. Um, you know, the culture of your company really has an impact uh, in, in who's going to actually sit there and drive to work every day or actually make a move and, 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 and transplant down to South Florida. But there is one thing I did learn recently. Um, about our company and something that we've been doing tremendously wrong in terms of talent recruitment is the onboarding process. Uh, it's incredibly important when you're onboarding new employees that they feel they are part of something much bigger than coming to work, meeting with uh, you know operations people and finance people and tech people. There is a real um, art form to onboarding uh, new employees, and I think it's it, it's really shifting how our our, our talent retention is. is is, uh, is, is going this, this route. Um, I think that's one. And, and, and something else we're seeing is, is basically why people are coming to work at your company. It, it's getting a lot more detail than just a payroll and, and making good money. It's actually they want to work for something, something meaningful. For us, you know, we, sell, we, we save you know, energy and dollars for commercial buildings. But at the heart of what our co a company does is, is you know, enable a much greener planet, um, sustainability, and this, this really is driving at what talent, you know, new talent wants to come and work with, as opposed to just you know, a company paying good salary and giving good uh, vacation. Yeah, you mentioned an, 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 a very challenging topic, and it's culture, and, and how to have a clear understanding of the culture of your company, yeah. your <laughs> values, your, uh, your mission. Uh, so it, it's something that we also are facing. Uh, but uh, if you can elaborate a little bit more, because many entrepreneurs do not take uh, too much attention at this relevant aspect. 
Well, a lot of people think, you know, you're a technology company and you got to become a Silicon Valley-based company or, you know, think like a Silicon Valley company. We keep to our roots. We are a South Florida company founded by, you know, two founders that went to public high school here in, in Miami. Uh, we have Cuban coffee at 2.30. Uh, you know, it, it's a very relaxed environment, and, and I think people are embracing that. They realize, you know, we had our VP of operations just moved down from New York, and, uh, and he's now drinking a cafecito at 2.30. He's, you know, he, he walks in and sees pastelitos on Friday. Uh, so it, it's, you know, it's, it's different. Um, but, you know, one thing I'll say is you keep to your roots, you keep your culture, don't change into something that you're not. Um, and that, that, that's really going to help attract talent. So, taquitos and empanadas every day. Cachapa. <laughs> How do you address this? <laughs> Sebastian. Uh, I want to share something on, on two things. One is, yes, talent. In, in this age, you can hire good talent anywhere. And we have tools to work uh, remotely and you don't have to build a completely local team uh, like that works in, in one office. Uh, we have many offices uh, around, uh, around the world and people working from many countries. And yes, Slack is a very good tool, but there are many tools that can help you build a distributed team. And that gives you access to better talent for more economically. Um, when you do that, you also face another challenge is that how you build a culture and how you build a team that uh, feels like that is together, that it's, it's, more, it's easier to build a good culture in a company that is everybody is friends and they, and they spend a lot of time together very close. Um, so for a, for a more distributed company, that is one of the challenges. Um, but I think like putting a lot of attention on your culture is very important because everybody wants to stay in a company that is doing well. Like if your company is growing, you have funds, that you're in the news, and you can be proud and talk with your, to your friends that you're working in this or that. Um, everyone wants to stay in a company that, that, that is up and to the right. But not, not every company goes through hard times. And in bad times is where a company shows what it's made of. And if you build it a good culture that people want to maintain, and wants the, the company to su survive, uh, they will stay and you won't lose anyone when you're going through bad times. Um, and that is when, when you sh it shows what you have done. This is a question for all of you. How is Endeavor helping you, helping your organization to scale your business. Uh, what takeaway can the audience bring to their companies about Endeavor with this uh, regard? So, uh, I, I go first. So, uh, I think like the most powerful thing of Endeavor is their network. I think it has a, a very good uh, network of um, people that want to help startups and or previous successful entrepreneurs that have gone through many things that you, you're facing that you can go and talk, uh, potential partnerships that you can build, um, and things that could change your, your business. Um, very early on, when, when we just started through the process, we got our first intro to the CTO of a bank, mm -hmm. which we end up having a bank account. And, and that was key for, for, our, for our business. Uh, more recently, we uh, had lunch with um, Gal Perin from Mercado Libre, and we are now have a partnership with Mercado Libre, which is doing very well, and it has changed our numbers significantly. And that has been very help from, from Endeavor. So for us, you know, as, as you scale, um, there's new challenges that you're going to face, and you can either face them alone and, and feel the bumps or, or have a, a, a network of advisors um, that will help guide you through that process, whether it's retaining talent or, you know, as an entrepreneur, you know, we have institutional investors, we have a board, they have a, a set of directives to, to help drive the company, but the entrepreneur still needs to, you know, have a lookout. And this is what we believe Endeavor brings. You know, we're, a, we're now on year nine of our company. We're not, you know, early stage. And, uh, and we just joined Endeavor recently. 
So it, it, I think a lot of the, the preconceived notion is it's for a company that's just starting up. It's not. It's definitely for the entrepreneur that, that realizes, you know what, I need somebody to have my back, help me through this process. Uh, and that's what we feel Endeavor is going to bring. Yeah, and I, and I can attest that from NOAA payment perspective. That has been amazing, the support of Endeavor. Uh, not only Endeavor Miami, but also Endeavor uh, uh, in different countries, uh, from uh, Colombia to Mexico to Uruguay to Chile. So it's amazing, the network. So I think we all need to take advantage of that. So any other uh, comment that w you would like to share with the audience of uh, the challenges uh, at scaling your business? So I think on the on the um, Endeavor front, Endeavor has been, I mean, I, th I think that the most valuable thing from Endeavor, like you said, is the network. Um, so if you take advantage of the network, um, you will make good use um, of, of Endeavor. And I think that they help, help us, especially in terms of advisors in different countries. Um, and even advisors within our country of origin that have businesses outside and can point us in different directions. Um, so yeah. yeah. Any any lessons? Any other lessons? <laughs> you know, uh, like I, I think I said it earlier. You know, just just be be cautious when you're getting ready to scale globally. Um, global scale can you know big companies crush little companies a lot. Um, so you just need to think about it, put a strategy in place, and then just go. Um, you know, you're going to have bumps and bruises when you scale globally. You're going to go at nuances and challenges, but they'll overcome, and, and it's, you're going to have a much better company for that. Well, I, I, I think we all agree that there's no playbook um, going uh, scale, but I think this has been very beneficial uh, for me that I'm, I run a, a, a regional company, and I hope that for every one of you as well. So thank you for joining us, and I don't know if we have a chance to, to make questions for you from the audience. So, no? no okay. okay, well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye -bye.